Good morning, nature lovers. My name is Jim Butcher. I'm a member of the Coastal Prairie Chapter of the Texas Master Naturalists. And you're right here in my backyard in the Woods Edge Estates neighborhood. Uh, we're about halfway between Rosenberg and Fulcher, the main drag, and about a mile kind of east off Farm Road 359, in case you're wondering where I am. Uh, this particular property we bought from the developer in 1980, it's just a little bit under four acres. And uh, going back to the origination, I'm, I'm not going to go past the Pleistocene age or anything, but uh, just wanted to let you guys know that the original owner was Samuel Isaacs. Uh, he purchased this property and 2,228 more acres from Stephen F. Austin about 200 years ago. And the price he paid, if you're looking here carefully, Greg, two quarters for four acres. That's what the going rate was back then. The county appraisal district now has this acreage at $100,000 per acre. So that tells you pretty much what inflation does. Uh, Samuel Isaacs transferred it over to a Mr. Burton. This used to be the Burton Plantation. And uh, one of his slaves uh, became the first sheriff, black sheriff, after reconstruction in Fort Bend County. You can find out more about Moses Burton at the Fort Bend County Museum. Uh, after that, this land was owned by Josephine Abercrombie, and uh, it was basically used for growing sugarcane and then cattle. Uh, as Dr. Rector says, most of the land in Texas has changed hands five, six, seven times. So from the original state, which you're looking back here, this was a tall grass prairie and everything around here you would not have seen any trees at all due to the burns that uh, the Indians did and lightning kind of had a hand in doing that too. So uh, this is my recreation of a tall grass prairie. Some of the plants I'm standing around here are the partridge pea. Uh, this is probably one of the best or my favorite called eastern gamma grass. Every one that I planted took off and has been stellar. Back in February of this year, I completely burned all of this stuff to the ground and the tallest thing here was about maybe an inch and a half. So everything you see here has come back from almost nothing and that's the way nature works. Uh, I make a lot of mistakes, but nature seems to not make any. She knows what goes where and she puts it in the right place. Okay, thank you, Greg. Okay, this uh, particular grass is called switchgrass. Uh, this is the native switchgrass, not the Alamo that gets to be gigantic. Uh, they're now using switchgrass as a biofuel and, and not including corn as one of the uh, fuels it's using. They're now using switchgrass. Uh, I don't know the uh, scientific part of it as to how they convert a grass to fuel, but uh, this is something they're very definitely interested in. Back here, we've got big blue stem, and you'll notice it's more shaded, so it's not growing quite as tall as everything around it. Uh, this is a live oak tree that's providing some shade, so every one of these grasses and plants uh, acts different according to the soil, the amount of water it gets, and the uh, sunlight. Uh, over here, we've got some blue mist flowers. Uh, that's a great pollinator species. But uh, the big grasses, as you can see, have outcompeted everything else out here. I used to have rattlesnake masters and different forbs like, uh, let's see, we had uh, Texas cone flowers growing. But like I say, they've been outcompeted, so nature takes over. <laughs> over here, this third of this entire segment two years ago uh, was just St. Augustine grass, just like the beautiful, as I call it out here, a green desert because nothing really lives in it. But uh, the basket flowers I planted took a leap and they went out about 20 feet and proliferated over here on the uh, west side. This year, the basket flowers are all but gone and the uh, partridge pea has taken over. And the partridge pea is a great plant for bees, and I understand sulfur butterflies, and this year I have seen a profusion of sulfur butterflies out here. So 
If you build it, they will come. One thing I'd like to mention is whether you've got 500 acres in Edna, like Carl Baumgartner, or you just have a second floor townhouse with a patio, if you plant one native plant and one insect stops by to get a drink and say hello, you've done a good job. So don't worry about the scale of the place. Uh, when you start a pollinator garden, please start out slow and small. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> back to the other side of my uh, pocket prairie here. I failed to mention that I am a certified wildlife interpreter by Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, the videographer here, Greg Hurley, uh, has got a whole lot of uh, expertise and he knows make sure the uh, sun is in the right direction. Uh, this plant here is called an American Beautyberry. Uh, the funny thing about this particular one is when I planted it, it was 50 feet over there on that side of the uh, the weed patch as some people call it but uh, it died and the next year I guess this is the son or daughter of that beauty berry and it showed up completely obversely on the other side of the garden which is a miracle to me but uh, there are some birds that feed on these things uh, I haven't seen them yet but uh, it's ready to go thank you All right, this is the west side of my house. I'm standing in front of the garage. That's real exciting, isn't it? Over here's the water well. <laughs> it's got, got to be done. Uh, this particular plant here is a volunteer. It's called an elderberry. They're ubiquitous all over Fort Bend County. I understand there's a lot of uses for the berries, uh, which happen to be gone this part of the year, but uh, it's a very good plant, it's a good native, and it's good for nectar for different critters. Uh, over here, I planted a eastern gamma grass. It gets so much shade, it's really not done much because I put it in the wrong place. But uh, that happens. It's still clinging on to life. Uh, this guy here is a volunteer. Uh, it just showed up a couple of years ago. It's called a pokeberry. And uh, you've probably heard the old song, Poke Salad Annie. Well, this is where the berries come from. The uh, leaves are actually quite edible, but you have to boil them three times to get all the tannin out of it. So it's very labor intensive, but if you're a poor person living on a share crop type of thing, this is your plant, everything's free. Uh, over here, my friend across the street, Natalia Crawford, and I, when she was uh, active in the chapter, we went to a uh, event and we each got a seed pod of three uh, Mexican buckeyes. Uh, all three of hers died, two of mine died, but one of them is doing quite well. This is a Mexican buckeye. For all you arborists out there, I don't know the Latin name, but uh, it's okay. Some people probably do. Thank you. Okay, here we are at the pollinator garden. Uh, this thing I started probably eight or nine years ago uh, before I learned a whole lot about uh, how to prepare the soil. I just used Roundup and killed all the St. Augustine grass. Then I got a rake and removed all the thatch. I spent $12 uh, for the Texas Oklahoma mix at Native American Seed Company and spread it all out among this, it was probably maybe 15 by 30 feet. And the first year I had a profusion of uh, Mexican hat and gallardia, which was really spectacular. And then from time to time, I would take a couple of plants from the Seaborn nursery and plant them out here. So consequently, uh, the forbs that I ended up right here, uh, I'll just, hate to do it, but I'm going to read down the list of everything that I identified back in, uh, I guess, around May. Uh, Scarlet Sage, Mexican Hat, Blue Mist, Rattlesnake Master, Texas Coneflower, Clasping Leaf Coneflower, Rosin Weed, Button Bush, Leatris, Green Milkweed, Butterfly Weed, Brown Fennel, Wild Onions, Landsleaf Coreopsis, Baptisia, uh, here's the White Gara right here. Purple Coneflower, Swamp Sunflower, Golf Vervain, Mealy Blue Sage, Ludwigia, 
Indian blanket, wild petunias, crimson eyed rose mallow, and creeping daisy. So that's about 26 different forbs that are going here. Unfortunately, this time of year, due to the succession, there's not a whole lot blooming. Uh, most of it has come and gone already. We're here in the fall, so uh, it's not really too spectacular unless you're a nature lover like I am. So uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the plants here are very varied. We get quite a bit of different pollinators, and uh, I've got a hummingbird feeder, a bird feeder, a bird bath, and uh, over on that side of the lot, I've actually got an area that's friendly for fireflies, which a lot of people don't know how to do an environment or a habitat for those guys, but they are out here during the summer, and they're a lot of fun to watch. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, a little patch here of seaside goldenrod. And uh, I did not plant this. It volunteered here about three or four years ago. I do have a couple of goldenrod over here, but somehow I guess a bird did some pooping or something. And I ended up with one or two of these stalks. And since then I've been mowing around it. Uh, in a week or two or maybe a month, this will be a profusion of yellow flowers and pollinators from all over the county are gonna come here and have a picnic. So uh, this is really a good plant. It's just right before the succession. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, this uh, particular tree right here fooled me for 30 entire years. Uh, I moved out here with the family back in 1984. And believe it or not, uh, the first traffic signal going into Houston happened to be at 90A and Highway 6 from here, if you can believe that. So uh, this tree has pretty much been static the entire time we've lived here for 40 years. So uh, over here's an oak tree, which was maybe three inches tall that I've been mowing around. And now it's the same height as this tree. So I called a friend of mine and mentor, Carl Bumgardner, to come over and identify it. And he took one look and he said, what you've got here is a gum bromelia tree. Actually, you can see there's two of them. So there's no telling how old these things are because I looked them up online and the maximum height they get is 35 feet. And these guys have been 35 feet for at least 40 years. So like I say, it's a great tree. Uh, it does have berries that the birds eat and uh, it's native. So I'm gonna keep it. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Okay, here we are under the spreading canopy of a pecan tree. This is also called a, uh, the state tree of Texas. In case you didn't know, when the legislature gets together, they always have time on their hands because they're not passing anything important. So they've also deemed the pecan as the state pie, and the pecan is also the state nut. Uh, it's called Coria Illinoisensis, apparently because the first time the settlers saw this tree, it was in Illinois. But it's our state tree, and uh, if you'll notice here, this is a bushel of pecan nuts that I picked up just last year. Now, you're probably wondering, uh, how big is a bushel? It's 2,150 cubic inches. And you've probably heard that song, I Love You, A Bushel and a Peck. Anybody know what a peck is? Of course you don't. I had to look it up too. A uh, peck happens to be eight quarts or one quarter of a bushel. So this one's going to have some pretty good nuts on it over here this year. Come on out and pick them up and I'll give you halvesies. How's that for a deal? Now over here, this is the live oak tree. It's exactly 41 years old because I've been mowing around it since it was a baby. Uh, this is the Quercus virginiana. And uh, it should be our state tree, but it's not. They're very indigenous to here. It's probably the only tree that you'd find out in the prairie in what was called a mott, just a cluster of oak trees. Uh, if you go down to Goose Island, you'll see one of the oldest ones in the state. It's really magnificent. So uh, this is the smartest thing I had in my head when I moved in here before I became enlightened. Uh, 
and planted ligustrums and aspidistras and sago palms. I also planted some yopons and some oak trees. So, you know, even a fool can <laughs> get lucky sometimes. Now for the joke of the month, uh, one of my favorites was about a man who was selling used cars. And uh, he was cheating people right and left, but he decided he wasn't making enough money. So to go where the big money was, he got elected to Congress. And uh, he got paid by all the lobbyists and passed BS legislation, and he was pretty much a horrible man. So when he finally passed away, he was next appearing at the gates of hell, and Lucifer himself welcomed him through the gates with his pitchfork and everything. So this guy's being escorted back to the special place in hell for used car salesmen and politicians. I guess you didn't know there was such a place, but there is. So as he's walking up these paths, there's people in boiling oil just screaming and shouting, and they're just in horrible pain. And he's going, God, what's going on for me? This has got to really be bad. So he passes this bench, and there's this pretty girl sitting down, and he looks next to her, and there's this guy that used to be his lawyer. And he says to the devil, he says, that's preferential. You can't treat him like that. And the devil stabs him with the pitchfork, and he says, don't you dare tell me how to treat that woman. So I bid you adieu. Uh, thanks for being a master naturalist. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And uh, thank you again, Greg, for doing the videotaping. And uh, we'll see you guys down the road.